We are now recording this session. Okay. You know, we received a lot of donations for this event, and it's just great. We'll be ready to uh, for next year's live event. Thank you. In person. Yes. And thank you for all those who have helped keep this event going. It's a good reminder to join us again at five o'clock for Beers and Brews. Uh, bird of the Year, and then followed up with Mark Caldwell talking about shorebirds. And tomorrow morning, starting brightly at 8 o'clock, we have Rob again live at the Arcata Marsh. And then our keynote speaker tomorrow night at 7 o'clock on ear birding. All right, looks like we got about 24 people that have joined already at least, huh? Yeah. 27. And it's Plus just, just panelists. about two o'clock, yes. Okay. Uh, but maybe I ask Shoshona to share the 2019 Godwood video just to get some excitement going. Oh, Sounds of course. Good. Coming right up. Who is that mask man? I'll just do this while you can see all the skulls in the background. Nice. Oh, okay, here we go. It's epic. That is so all right. Epic. Yes. All right. Okay. And just, just a reminder before you get going, Rob, for our audience that uh, there is both the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. If you just want to chat around. And if you have questions that we'll get to at the end of it or during it, um, be sure to do your question and answer session. So both of those are available to you. Sounds yeah. good. All right. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. This is Rob Fowler, as Bob already mentioned. I uh, probably know a lot of you, but if I haven't met you before, then uh, welcome to God with Days and thanks for joining us. As you can see, as you might see the skulls behind on the walls here, I'm in the Wildlife Museum in Hubble State University, which was, I think, established around in the 40s from what Tamar said. And I'll just kind of stop talking and showing my face and we'll just kind of do a little intro to Tamar here and have her tell us a little bit about herself and uh, maybe how long she's worked at the museum here and what she does and what her actual position is here. So here we go. Let me try flip the screen here. Hey, Tamar. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the museum. I want to have some of that dramatic music playing behind me. It would make everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
anyway, welcome. Thanks for coming um, to this virtual tour of uh, the Wildlife Museum. I've never done a virtual tour like this before, so we're all kind of learning to get there. We'll see how it goes. Um, so I'm the curator of the Wildlife Museum, which is not the Natural History Museum, right? We have a Natural History Museum uh, across from Wildberries in Arcata, and that's a public museum. They do educational programs for the public. This is a collection of birds and mammals, but we're not going to talk about mammals today because of the bird watching festival. Come back for the mammal watching festival. We'll talk about mammals. Um, we're going to talk about the birds in our collection. It's a collection of birds and mammals that are used. We have lots of exhibits, um, so they're used for display, and the public's welcome to come in and see them normally, not right now. And, um, and we have uh, specimens that are used for teaching. We are a university. We teach students here. And we have a huge collection that is used for research. So we are in the collection room right now, and later I think we'll wander over and look at some exhibits. But right now we're in the collection room and I'm gonna show you what these specimens look like that we use for research and that are very different from, um, from things that are on exhibit. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we have here, sort of the format that we keep these specimens. And then um, I'm gonna show you some, some I guess, oddities and curiosities. Um, not my title, so I'm like, hey, <laughs> um, So some oddities and curiosities when we get those. And then we'll go look at a few interesting, um, unusual displays in the building. Um, but anytime you have any questions, please um, post, Rob, can you do that? Can you read questions? Yeah, I'll read the questions. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Um, any questions that come up or, um, you know, I'm I'm gonna show you some things that I think are interesting. There's a lot of stuff here. I, I'm not gonna show you everything. Um, if there's something that you've always wanted to see and you're wondering if we have, like you've always wanted to see an elephant bird egg, put in the chat, ask to see an elephant bird egg. I'll have to say I don't have one. <laughs> so that'll be a bummer, but maybe there's something else you've always wanted to see that you could um, put in the chat if there's something you wanna see. And maybe other people would be interested in that as well. Um, okay, so. We have in our collection, birds and mammals, as I said, we have on display in the building, we have over a thousand birds on, ex on exhibit, about a thousand birds on exhibit. Um, so once we're back to normal times and everything's open, please come to the building and wander around and look at all our wonderful bird exhibits. Um, but we have almost 16,000 birds in our collection. I I'm sorry, specimens, not just birds. Um, so around um, 9,000 birds, um, plus 3,500 eggs, egg and nest, nest contents, individual eggs, around 10,000. And those are not on exhibit. Most of that stuff is not on exhibit, right? If only 1,000 things are on display, exhibit. So where everything else is in, is in this room. And this is the collection room. We call it a museum. It's not an exhibit museum, research and teaching. So um, if you look at this, bald eagle up here, two bald eagles actually. Everybody looks at the big wing spread bald eagle and thinks it's a golden eagle. I call it my trick question because everybody goes at home. Anyway, it's a juvenile bald eagle. If you can imagine that um, I had 9,000 um, bald eagles with their wings spread like that, I'd need a really big room to put those in. So the specimens for research and teaching are not mounted in a lifelike position. That's called taxidermy. And what we do um, to collect lots of things for, re for research and teaching, they're not mounted in a lifelike position and they're called study skins or research specimens. And um, they're compact and allow us to collect a lot of them. So I wanna show you some of those. Let's start, it's Godwit days. So let's look at some Godwits. All right. And how long has the Wildlife Museum been in existence? Tomorrow? So the museum really started with the wildlife program in the mid 1940s. Mm -hmm. um, we had a small collection of maybe 400 birds here. And then um, when Stan Harris became a professor in the wildlife department, which was 1959, he retired in 1993, I believe. And we, when he got here, there were 400 birds in the collection in 1959. When he left, there were, I believe, 6,000. So he is wow. really the reason that we have this substantial collection. And he's also the reason that we have 1,000 birds on exhibit. He and his, and his students 
either acquired or prepared most of those assessments. Wow. So obviously I'm not gonna put a lot of taxidermy, fit a lot of taxidermy birds in this cabinet, but this cabinet, I was just gonna throw out a number how many birds are in this one open cabinet. And honestly, I have no idea. Maybe a couple hundred would be my guess. So here are Godwits. Um, they're not mounted in a lifelike position. <laughs> this bird is not pretending to be alive. This bird is not fooling anybody. Um, no, it's kind of alive. Does it? No, not really. It's the cotton just, eyes? Is yeah, the cotton, the cotton eyes, yeah. Eyes. It's I just sleeping. It that, yeah, it's just sleeping. It that, um, had a bad night kind of look. Um, yeah, so they're compact. The skin is all here. Um, there's a tag with a lot of information on it. And I talk, I talk about these collections as libraries. So I'm really a librarian of dead. I'm the librarian of the dead. <laughs> so, um, so just like in a library, you have information that's housed in books and I don't know, CDs and microfilm and documents and maps, but it's really a collection of information. And in my library, my information is housed in skins and skulls and bones and eggs and nests. But it's really about information because all of this information is useful for a researcher. So what is all the information that's on there? What, what, is that, the what does that say there? there? Well, it says Limosa Fedoa. I'm probably not pronouncing it. No, that's, right. I, that's never right. Learned, yeah. I never learned to pronounce my Latin. Yeah, uh, Lazuli, Lazuli, you know. I mean. <laughs> I, I often intentionally pronounce them wrong because I pronounce them the way they're spelled so right. that I will know how to spell them. Um, so that is the Latin name of um, Godwood Days. We really should call it Mimosa Fidula Days. <laughs> Doesn't that kind of have a better name? <laughs> Sounds um, classy. It says Field Landing Boat Ramp, Humboldt County, California. Mm. Um, that's where this bird was collected. It, was col it has the collector's name. It's, it was collected by Lizzie Floyd. Um, oh, it was wow. collected on the 6th of March, 2016. Okay. So it's relatively recent. Yeah. Um, not going back to the 1940s when mm -hmm. the museum mm -hmm. started. Um, it's a female and it has a catalog number. It's number 9634. So just like everything's cataloged in the library, everything's cataloged. So we know it is, you can find it. But wait, there's more information on the back. It has, it has uh, weight. We can't weigh it now. It's stuff we caught. That won't be very much. <laughs> Um, it has measurements that you, some measurements you can take after their stuff, some measurements, not so much. Um, it has description of, um, was it fat? Was it thin? Um, was it molting? Um, this is a female. There's a description and a measurement of the ovary because in birds, their, their sex organs change drastically in size and condition based on on the um, time of the year. So um, especially if you're migrating, you don't wanna be carrying around heavy uh, reproductive organs when you're migrating because you have to fly really far, flight takes a lot of energy and carrying around these organs that you're not gonna be using right, for a while. So they shrink way down. So we always measure the, the organs. Um, it says, oh, it has my name on it. Um, and it was specimen number 1,984 for me that I prepared on the 12th of April, 2016. So that's all the information. All of this is in a database. You can actually look it up online and you can see all the information associated with this, with this um, specimen. Awesome. Um, our database is online available to anyone, researchers and anyone who's interested. Um, it's on something called a database aggregation site. So- <coughs> Excuse me. So um, it's a site where if you're interested in Godwits that were found dead in 2016, you can put those search uh, quest, uh, criteria in and it will search our collection and all the other collections in this data aggregation site, which include the Smithsonian, the American Museum of Natural History, um, the Los Angeles County Museum. Uh, there's like three or <coughs> Excuse me, three. sorry about that. 350 museums, I think, or collections are included, something like that. So you can do a search for your research on all of these locations at once. So it's kind of fun to play with that and see what's out there and, and what there is. You can find out who has an elephant bird egg. Tomorrow, somebody just asked, uh, yeah. what is the name of the website and maybe the oh, address? I, 
that's thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's called vertnet, v e r t n e t dot org, and it's all vertebrates. So um, you can search fish, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, and birds there. Okay. So it's it's fun to play with. That. Cool. Hey, it looks like there's a banded one in there too, huh? Oh. There's a god with a band on it right there. Right here. Cool. So what do we know about What's this story about bandit? that bird? Well, this banded godwit. was collected in North Humboldt Bay. It does not say where it was banded. So I don't know, but this is uh, before my time, 1981. Oh, wow. So um, is 1981 old for a specimen? I mentioned that the museum started, look more godlets. I mentioned that the museum <laughs> started in, um, in uh, the mid 40s, but the specimens go back much further than that. So here is a godwit with um, kind of a rough bill going on there. And if you can look at this original data tag. I don't know if people could see that. Maybe you could see that. I know some people said the video is a little bit blurry, but oh, hopefully y'all can see that. Well, I picked a really Very old cool. specimen that Oh, there's the date, 1922. Wow. So we do have some very old specimens and theoretically they'll last forever, as long as I do my job and take care of them. Yeah. So specimen could last for hundreds of years. And how does, how do you take care of the specimens? How do you make them last for that long? One thing I do is I put them in these cabinets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, there you go. And they're not refrigerated or anything like that. Um, the cabinets, keep bugs out. Mm -hmm. So just like moths will eat your wool sweater, <laughs> there are moths, there are little tiny beetles, there are mites that will all eat skins and, and feathers and fur. So keeping bugs away is really important. Historically, specimens were treated with a lot of nasty chemicals. Um, like mothballs and stuff? Oh or no, much nastier than much that. Much nastier than that, yeah. <laughs> um, arsenic Ooh, was yeah. a standard you, you wipe the inside of the skin with arsenic paste before you stuff it. It works really well, it keeps bugs away. Keeps people away too. Um, mercury was used. Um, yeah, so compared to that moth balls. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we don't use chemicals anymore, which means it's harder to keep the bugs away. And what I do is I, I freeze things. So. Um, everything new that comes in goes into a freezer. I just um, got a loan back today. I loaned some specimens out for research. They came back, they go into the freezer. So I'm not bringing bugs back mm. into the collection. Mm -hmm. If I have a bug outbreak, take everything out of that cabinet, freeze it all. So that's, what we, so that's, so that's one way. Another thing these cabinets are doing is they're sort of controlling the environment in here. They're keeping light out because light will fade things. That's a chemical deterioration. Um, and then handling, we want to handle things properly so we don't rip them apart. So those are the three things that will cause things to deterioration. There's mm -hmm. a chemical deterioration, um, bugs, and ripping them apart physically, yeah. which the students, you know, they don't do it intentionally. Yeah, right? yeah. Some specimens get handled a lot. Um, so those are called study skins. We also have um, a small collection of skeletal material, um, but I want to show you my favorite collection because I get to do whatever I want here. So I'm showing you <laughs> my favorite collection. So <laughs> would that be maybe you know, eggs? <laughs> so we have an egg collection. Tamar's and pride and joy here. I love the eggs. Wow. So I used to work at so is this all bird eggs or is that two these two cabinets? Okay. Um, I used to work at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm. If you've never been there, you should go. It's lovely. It's historic. It's the beautiful yeah, setting. Yeah. Um, awesome. The, San the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History was founded in 1913 as the Museum of Comparative Oology. Oology was the study of eggs. And egg collecting was this big hobby from about the, the late 1800s till about World War II. Um, and so People who loved nature back in the 19th century and before probably, um, if you love nature, you went out and killed it and brought it home because that's how you appreciated it. So, um, so people go out and collect eggs 
and and it became illegal. This is not good for birds collecting eggs, obviously. It became illegal in the um, early 20th century. Um, and, um, and so these egg collections over the years, grandpa's egg collection of a grandpa passed away, and what are we gonna do with this egg collection? So they got, they got donated to universities and museums over the years. So the reason I love eggs, they're biological and I'm a biologist and I love biological eggs. They're beautiful. And they're historic. They have to be historic. We can't collect eggs anymore. So let's show you some beautiful historic eggs. Wow. I'll just kind of scan this whole. So those are thrushes. Those are robins, robin, robin egg blue. Not much compared to catbird, catbird egg blue right there, and then mockingbirds, mottled ones. At the end. These are, which ones are catbirds? So these are catbirds. These oh, dark, okay. These dark, these dark blue dark ones. Egg. Aren't those pretty? Yeah, those are beautiful. Yeah. Sorry for the shadows there, buddy. Yeah, hard to get a good. Hard to I'm get sure a the good view. Yeah. But kind of imagine. Yeah. The color that we're seeing. Yeah. So these are not going to hatch. <laughs> um, Every egg has a single hole drilled in it at the widest part, not at the ends. Let's see if I can see. There's um, one that you can has, see. I put them with one the hole there. Hole. Yeah. And then, like if you look at, uh, maybe look at this one here. Mm -hmm. So there's one egg with, you can see the hole. I'm, I'm shadowing with my finger. Um, there's a tiny hole. That's the only hole in the egg in the content are drained out. And there are some numbers that are written around the hole. One of those numbers identifies the species and to a specimen that connect it to its data. Oh, wow. So these guys were really meticulous. I say guys because they were mostly men. Mm -hmm. um, they're really meticulous about recording um, the details of the nest and the location and the date and the time. And we have all this data with them. So I can match these eggs back up to their data, which is this really amazing um, research resource so i think i remember the last time i was here which was god how long has it been since i've been in the museum two years long, too long. i think you're actually still category oh really? cataloging everything in the computer in the database still yeah if that, i remember correctly yeah that, that would have been a while ago so we got a large collection i don't remember what year it was 2003 2005 yeah. yeah. maybe we got a lot that doubled, almost doubled the size of our egg collection. Wow. From a local, a local man, um, the Zerlangs, who are well known locally, uh -huh. um, and um, their grandfather was an egg collector in Humboldt County in the 1920s. Wow. So. So when was it? When was egg collecting outlawed again? What years? Well, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act went into effect in 1918, I believe. Mm -hmm. And people could still continue collecting after that because they could get permits, mm -hmm. um, but they they had to do documentation. Um, and and by the mid 1940s, they were pretty much not letting anybody collect it okay. anymore. So there are odds and ends post mid 1940s, but not very much. Okay. Um, our oldest egg, I believe, is from the ugh, like 1885. Wow. Something like that. Amazing. So, so a, a quick note on how, how these would be used for research. Um, this is a classic story that we like to tell in the museum egg world <laughs> <laughs> about, I, I give a whole presentation called Dead Birds Saving Live Birds. So this is part of that, Dead Birds Saving Live Birds. Um, the bald eagle, the peregrine falcon, uh, the brown pelican were all endangered species. And they were all endangered for the same reason, right? They were endangered because of DDT, because DDT was ca causing the eggshells to become very thin. And when the birds went to incubate the egg, the, the eggs just collapsed and there was virtually no reproduction happening. DDT was a really good pesticide that came on the market um, around World War II. And by the 1960s, they were really seeing huge, huge, huge population declines in this species. Um, Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring about DDT. 
So when the ornithologists went to the makers of DDT and said, you have to stop making this stuff because it's killing off these birds. And they said, prove it. Okay, we're scientists, we have to prove this. How do you prove something? You have to measure eggshells that have been exposed to DDT and compare them to eggshells that have not been exposed to DDT. But DDT was used everywhere in the environment for decades. Where are you gonna find eggshells that have not been exposed to DDT? In the past. You go back in the past, you go to the museum and you get some brown pelican eggs from 1926. These are brown pelican eggs from oh. 1926. These are healthy brown pelican eggs. Mm. They were healthy until the collector collected them and mm -hmm. drained the contents out. <laughs> Um, we have quite a few brown pelicans. Oh, these don't have any data. That's too bad. Then I have this. These are brown pelican eggs from 1969. Oh, wow. So that, that's what DDT, that's from Anacapa Island, mm -hmm. Ventura County. That's mm -hmm. what DDT does to pelican eggs. And you can, you know, when you think of your chicken egg and how, <laughs> your, your egg that you eat at home, there's that. There's that membrane on the inside of the shell. On these eggs, the membrane looks like it's thicker than the eggshell. The eggshell is just barely uh, dusting on top wow. of the, the membrane. So, so they they took DDT off the market as a result of studies that were done using museum specimens and brown pelicans, falcons, bald eagles have all recovered really really well. <laughs> Okay, cool. I'm gonna send Rob up the ladder with um, with the <laughs> with the camera. Oh so boy! Look at some cards. I hope I stay stable. You'll be fine. <laughs> here, I'll grab the camera here or the uh, ladder. It doesn't roll. Oh machine. boy. That looks pretty stable. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm ready. I'm ready. Whoa. Okay. These are common mer eggs. Look at those. Every common mer lays one egg and it looks different from all of its neighbors' eggs. That's amazing. So these are these are all the same species. Look at that. Every individual. Compare this one to that one. <laughs> Holy cow. They nest in colonies and they don't build nests. They just lay the egg on the rock. And then you go off to feed and you come back and there's a bunch of eggs on the rock. How do you know which one's yours? Wow. Well, they all look different. See how tapered these eggs are too? Which uh, means it'll roll around and just roll around in a circle and not roll off the ledge. Yep. Oh, sorry, Catherine, I'll slow down for you. <laughs> Are people I'm getting going, seasick? I'm now? going a little fast. I don't want to make you all egg sick. Okay, here we go. Thanks for noting that, Catherine. Wow, that's incredible. And look at that. That one's just purely white with a little bit of spotting. Very cool. So are these all mostly local Those are mostly mer local. colonies where these were taken from? A lot of these are from Castle Rock. Okay. Up in Del Norte County off of Crescent City. Huge colonies there. And there are other things. They wow, look at that one. They also used to collect a lot of tufted puffin eggs up there and they no longer breed there. So. We can we can look back at it's a it's a documentation of what used to be there that isn't there now. Amazing. And I would add that I don't think it's because of the egg collectors. That yeah. There. They didn't collect that. Amazing. Okay. There's all right, you guys all get a I'm good view. Or we're gonna move on here. I'm I'm I going. safely walked down. You're back on the ground. I'm back on the Here's ground. Right. Here, I'll just scan around too while Tamar's digging in the collection here. 
You can see all these skulls and antlers back there. And also some deer heads. It's like maybe some Colombian black tail and then some mule deer and also some elks, elk in the back there. Hey, there's a water buffalo. That's a cape buffalo. A cape buffalo. <laughs> cape buffalo. One of the most dangerous animals in Africa. Yeah, you don't want to mess with those. That one's fine though. Okay, I want to show you something few people in the world. So one of our local endangered species is the marbled merlet. The marbled merlets are bizarre because they are seabirds and seabirds, well, they're seabirds, they're alcids, right? They're, they're related to murres and puffins and um, ox. And, and all of this group nest on rock, offshore rocks. That's where it's safe, out in the ocean on offshore rocks. But our local marbled merlets, no, they had to be different. They nest at the tops of old growth trees as far as like 40 miles in. Like it's crazy. It's a very crazy thing for a seabird to do. And because they're nesting in such a strange place, the first merlet nest in a tree had not been found until I think it was 1973 or something like that. Yeah, Big Basin, Redwood State Park in Santa Cruz, I believe. I think so that's where it was. That a bird in North America which is crawling with ornithologists. <laughs> they had not found the first nest until the 1970s. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the way we find those nests now are you, you go out to sea, you capture merlets, you put a satellite transmitter on them, and then you follow them back to the nest, and that's how you find them. It's kind of cheating, isn't it? Um, <laughs> anyway, so nobody, had, nobody was, not, these guys back 100 years ago were not collecting marble merlet eggs, right? because they've never seen a nest. Um, so there are no marbled merlet eggs really in collections. But this is part of a marbled merlet egg. Wow. Um, this is from 2010. Look at how big that thing is. They only lay, yeah, it's not a big bird. Mm -hmm. They lay one egg and a pretty good size egg. Mm -hmm. And- um, the Merlet's like two thirds larger than that, <laughs> than that egg. <laughs> Maybe a little, a little bit bigger, yeah. I'm right, not no, exaggerating. This, this, is, this is a broken egg. You're just seeing one side of it and the other side's missing. And this is, I have a whole series of merlet eggshells that were found on the ground under nest trees in Prairie Creek State Park. So it's pretty cool that we get to have the eggs in our collection or parts of them, something that few people have ever seen. Okay, we probably need to move along. Huh? Time yeah, what time? 2.45. Oh my gosh. It's not 2.45. Wait, what'd you say? This is 235. Oh, 2.35. Okay. 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 Um, does right. anybody have any questions or anything else they'd like to see in the egg world before we move on? Yeah, let's see here. Q&A. No open questions right now. Um, well, there's some chat here. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Someone asked earlier, does the museum collect sounds too? Oh, no. No, we don't. Did you guys all hear that? Tamar said no. Sorry, no, we don't have a sound collection. We're really kind of, we are a small place. Yeah. <laughs> we are kind of limited. Um, and that's not a standard thing that museums collect usually sounds that requires a whole sort of level of equipment and focus and um you know cornell is the place that collects sounds yeah yeah macaulay it's not a standard thing that people collect right in, right in, in the context of these kinds of collections okay let me just see if there's anything else in the chat here uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. i think the audio recordings was the only one Oh, uh, somebody asked if some of the old specimens were treated with chemicals that you might be I aware assume, of. I assume that everything that was prepared before 1970 was treated with arsenic. Okay. I just assume that. Right. Because it was standard. It wasn't occasionally they treated things with arsenic. Mm -hmm. Everything was treated with arsenic pretty much. So yeah, absolutely. Oh, yes. Uh, somebody wanted... 
Uh, what's okay? Here's one. What's the most underrated part of the collection? One that people tend to pass over, but you find interesting. Well, I think that. I think that maybe that might have just been it. The egg collection. <laughs> Anonymous attendee. It is the egg collection. Uh, my opinion. I'm other. Yeah. <laughs> you might have other things. We all have our favorites. Sure. Um, and could you please repeat the link for the research site? Thanks. Yeah, the databases are on vertnet, V-E-R-T, like vertebrate, mm -hmm. V-E-R-T-N-E-T dot O-R-G. Oh, okay. And Bob Brown just posted it Excellent. in the comment section, I believe, the chat. So, uh, so let's see. So what do we want to do now? Should we go look at some of the interesting specimens that we maybe discussed? Like I pulled out some weird things. Oh yeah, we got those we can, first here. We can run through those real quick. Yeah, let's and do that. And then we can go look at some displays. Okay. And then we'll just do any other questions. Sounds we'll good. Okay, let's start with this. Is it weird? Yes, it is weird. Everything about this bird is weird. Look at Whoa. its head. Look at its little crest. It's weird. Look at those. Look at its feet. They are enormous. Uh -huh. They are weird. On its wings, it has these spurs that look very dangerous. It's kind of a weird prep. I did it, and there's another spur down here on the on the left wing. Oh yeah. You guys see that? Yep, there it is. I think you can see that. So I prepped it in this weird way because I wanted people to be able to see the spurs. So it, they wouldn't normally sit at the, <laughs> at the neck. They're just attached to the wings. So this bizarre thing is called a Southern Screamer. And I've never seen one in life. But I know very little about them. I have read that they do scream. They're very, very loud. Mm -hmm. That their, their, uh, their breeding calls can be heard two miles away. And... Um, I really don't know anything about them. Um, they use those spurs apparently for fighting. Um, but here's another really weird thing about them. I mean, you looked at this, you got a sense of what this weird thing looks like. The order that this bird is in is the Anseriformes, which is the order that has ducks, geese, and swans. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I think it might, this I was going to check and I forgot to, this might be the only other family in the order, only other than the Anseriformes, aside from the Anatidae, which are the ducks, geese, and swans. Hmm. So it's just, and here's another weird thing that nobody else knows about this bird except me. Um, so... I've skinned a lot of birds in my life. I know most people can't say that. One bird I've skimmed a few of are brown pelicans. Brown pelicans are plunge divers, right? They are heavy bodied birds and mm -hmm. they plunge down, they dive down, they hit the water. Now, when you cut one open, when I cut one open, you probably know. When I cut one open, they have all this connective tissue that, create, that has air bubbles in it all along the breast that creates a cushion. I call it bubble wrap. They have bubble wrap. And it makes sense. They're doing this plunge driving that cushions their body from that impact. Well, the crazy screamer had bubble wrap. I don't know why it's not a diving bait. Oh. I don't know. Hmm. If anybody knows the answer to this, I would like to know this. I believe I'm the only person in the world who knows that they have bubble wrap. Yeah, yeah. Somebody else must know it. Okay. Um, I that's oh, from so this zoo. was from the zoo, huh? Zoo. Yeah, okay. Not so bad. Gary Bloomfield noted that they have some at the Sequoia Zoo. Yeah, they used to have they one more. Had, uh, <laughs> So there's one less. <laughs> well, this, this has been a few years. It's been so. a few years, yeah. This is from sure. 2003. Oh, okay. Yeah. So maybe it's it's this one's relatives <laughs> that you can yeah. see. Um, I was thinking of other weird things to show you. I wanted to show you. So I was like, what, what do I have that's weird? Well, I have some weird hybrids. This is a hybrid duck. I should have people guessing what, what it what it Anybody is. want to take a guess? How Comment in the chat if you want to <laughs> make a guess on what kind. It is a hybrid, though. Yeah. 
Okay, somebody said Widgeon Gadwall. It is, is Widgeon. Let's see. Mostly American. Okay. We got other things to feed. We can't spend too much time. <laughs> this is a Widgeon Widgeon hybrid. You're Asian American? You're Asian American? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me see that one. This one right here. You're saying hybrid? No. Oh, okay. I was gonna say, yeah, yeah. You're Asian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hybrid. I was like, okay. <laughs> sometimes people see a Eurasian widgeon, and if it has green like that, they assume it's a hybrid. But that's generally not the case. This is a pure yeah. Eurasian one. here. It's pretty one. So. Yeah. So there's the so it's, it's our hybrid American down below. Lot of that here looks great. And hybrid in the middle, <laughs> Eurasian up top. Okay, there's another one. This is just a weird thing because it's a head. <laughs> it's just the head. We're just going say. off the head. Just going off the head. But there's another hybrid duck, and um, this is a hybrid green wing teal. And pintail, northern pintail. Can you guys see that? Colors. It really is kind of an intermediate color. I wonder how many of those there are in, in the wild. I have to look that up. Look up uh, photos in yeah. eBird or Macaulay. We have a lot library. of hybrid waterfowl, and I don't know if it's just because the hunters pick them out and and so they get focused on. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So here's another hybrid waterfowl. Weird looking thing. Big. That's a hybrid Canada snow goose. Mm -hmm. I could see that. Yeah. yeah. It's got the brown. Yeah, that's kind of obvious. The brown feathers on the side and the yeah. back. That's definitely Canada. This influence. right here is so Canada looking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this right here is so snow looking. So chin looking. <laughs> so chinny. Chinny. So that's kind of obvious. How about hybrid gulls? I think hybrid gulls should be illegal because it's hard enough to identify gulls as they are. Yeah, they're pretty so, tough. Um, here's our alleged hybrid gull. Looks like a gull. This is allegedly a hybrid Western glaucous wing. So if you look at those wing tips, it's not the same color as the back, but it's not black. So here's a Western. It's a little bit lighter on the back and lighter in the primary mm -hmm. tips. But here's a glaucous winged. Yeah, there's those glaucous winged dog. It's darker than the glaucous wing. That's hard to see. It is slightly darker than the glaucous wing. And the glaucous wing has the, the primaries the same color. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's so there, you know, there's some authorities oh. like Steve Howell say that some darkness in the wing tips of the glaucous wing gull is probably okay but this is obviously that's quite a bit that's too quite way too dark and then the back is a little bit darker as well you can see that mm -hmm. obvious contrast but not black yeah gray yeah anyway gulls yeah like, gulls ah, gulls it's okay. springtime anyways gulls are we're done with gulls i don't know if you guys can see if it's picking up the color that is a cool hybrid. <laughs> so Does anybody want to take a guess on what this is? It's obviously a hummingbird. <laughs> but what kind of hybrid hummingbird is this? And uh, we will say it's Arcata where this was taken, right? I think so. Where the specimen came from? Yep. Yep. So that is from Arcata. What's the date for that? This was found 26th of August, 1983 by Scandinavian. 26th August? Wow, that's crazy. That is crazy, isn't it? Yeah, because, you know, most of, uh, you know, you're not going to find any yeah. adult male Allens in anywhere around here. In so that here's an day. Allens. Look at the color on the, on the gorget. It's, yeah. It's not quite the same. That's so cool. And then there's mama or papa. Yeah. <laughs> well, the papa is the male, but um, <laughs> so so that whoops, that gorget does show 
just a little bit of the of the purple iridescence of the uh, the Annas. So mm -hmm. it's an Annas Allen's hybrid, and I want to point out. I don't know how to hold them so you can see them. Um, Three mini popsicles. I want to point out that Anna's hummingbirds and Alan's hummingbirds are in different genera. Mm -hmm. They're not in the same genus. So, so that means they're not as closely related. So it's, or that's what people think. So it seems weirder to me that they would be hybridizing between genera. Like that. Is that intrageneric, intrageneric hybridism? Is that what they call it? I think that's what they call it. Sounds right. Yeah. Okay, here's just a crazy bird. Mm. It's just a crazy bird. It's not a hybrid. Let's just get a it's just amazing. load of that bird. <laughs> it's a mostly tail. This is the yeah. body right there. Yeah, so. Sorry if I'm fun. going fast again. <laughs> Slow down. Zoom. Okay, sorry. Okay, so what is this bird? And what are these feathers? Because Rob got it wrong. The amazing thing about this bird is that these are not tail feathers. I got it wrong. These are wing feathers. You said that's the Oh, tail. did I say the tail feathers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. And oh I my gosh. Like this is, so that's oh my gosh. Yeah. These are wing feathers. Look at that. That's part of the wing. Here's the bird's tail. This is the tail. That's these insane. are wings. It's called a pennant winged nightjar. And um, I just picture it flying <laughs> with this beautiful. And um, is that African? I can't remember. They're African. Yeah. This bird is from Zambia. Okay. Yeah. I know so, there's some South American species that have some. So, so birds. Either long tail, long might be tail, tails. Like so. Yeah. No, why is African too? Well, night jars um, in night, South oh, America, jars, I think. Yeah. Um, so, so long tails are just cool because they're amazing, right? But, but long wing feathers, that's just, I don't know of that's other birds insane. that have long feathers yeah. like that. It's pretty crazy. So just really cool. Wow. Really cool. Um, and then I just wanted to show you these feathers because um, I have them sitting in a jar in the museum. Everybody who comes in asks me about them. So we have this one. <laughs> we have this one. We have this one. And Everybody gets excited about this feather. This one's actually my favorite, but this one's not bad either. And here's the really crazy thing about these three feathers. They all came from the same bird. They all came from the same bird. So this is a tail feather. This bird also has two long, and we're talking this long. Can you see that? Mm, yeah, let's see. Uh, everybody's kind of get the idea of how <laughs> long that is. I'm standing on my tip toes, okay? <laughs> Um, it has two long tail streamers in addition to the regular tail feather. Mm -hmm. So this is what the tail feathers look like. These are wing feathers. So how crazy is that? Wow. This is a primary. So, oh, let's go over here for a second. I always do this little ornithology lecture when I show these feathers. So on a wing, you have the arm, the wrist, and the hand. And the feathers that are attached to the hand bones are the primaries, and the feathers attached to the arm bones are the secondaries. So this is a primary. And you can imagine by the shape, it kind of has that primary shape. What I love about this feather is that it looks like three different feathers that are sewn together. And it looks like they're stitch marks sewing the different ones Beautiful. together. And then there's this orange going into blue, which is just so, so spectacular. Gorgeous. Wow. So this is this is my favorite feather. Everybody else likes this feather. I don't know. It's fine. It's pretty flashy. So but this bad. feather is a secondary feather. <laughs> so this bird does a display where it spreads its wings and it kind of does this. Um, it actually spreads its wings like this and creates a funnel around its head of all these spectacular feathers. And I know this because there's a video on YouTube. So, oh, what is the bird? I didn't even say what the Yeah, bird I was is. just going to ask. We didn't, I, I, it's not a pentail. This is it's a pentail. A, this is a pentail, but this that's not, that's not a pentail. <laughs> um, it's called a great Argus pheasant. So, Google great Argus pheasant videos. Um, there's a great video where there's a female, and the female is, you know, drab. 
and she's kind of walking along. This is at a some kind of a garden or a, a park or a zoo or something. And, and there are people, it's all people that are taking pictures. And the male walks by and when all his feathers are folded, he doesn't look like much either. He's got the long tail dragging. And then he walks up to the female and he goes, Foom, and makes this funnel of feathers. And he's like, <laughs> and she looks really bored. Anyway, awesome. check it out, the great Argus pheasant. Should we go look at some displays? Yeah, let's go look at some displays here? real quick from the last couple of minutes. Let me just grab my charger just to make sure I got enough juice on me and we don't die here. I think I'm still pretty well charged, but let's just go see this stuff here. Okay, let's do a really quick scan of what I've been working on. This is my prep lab. There's the prep lab. And I spent this semester with no students, so I've just been emptying out the freezer and I've been, I prepped all the small birds and all the small mammals. And now I'm gonna start working on larger things. So just spot it out. Oh, nice spotted. Yeah. So. Wow, got some gross beaks. Oh, a whole bunch of gross beaks. Some Dunlin. Okay, we don't need to identify all these. Just wanted to show you okay. real quick. We, okay. We're gonna run out of all time. All right, we're here. moving on. We're moving on, people. Bear with us here. Or bear with me mostly, I guess. Tomorrow's great. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if we're walking fast. We're going pretty fast. Breaking a sweat okay, here. So we're, we're going in here. Uh, into the Harris study room. You can see that. If you haven't been in this room before, you should definitely come check it out whenever uh, it's open again. Just do a quick scan. Just amazing specimen room. I used to study in this room all the time. So this is the student lounge, the Harris Study Lounge, named for Stan Harris, who did is responsible for most of these things being here. And Lori too, right? And Lori, yeah. So his wife painted all the the bills and the feet. So so once out, once the birds die, any color that was in in any exposed skin will fade. And so all the taxidermy has the beaks and the, the legs or any other exposed places are painted so that they look. Natural, <laughs> yeah. natural color. Um, so yeah, so Stan did the, the taxidermy and the glory would be painting. So this room is dedicated to them, but it's a study room for the students. I don't know how they study in here. I think it's very distressing. <laughs> yeah. um, but I wanted to give you some stories about some cool specimens in here. Um, so ah, yes, here we go. So, so here, this one on the, with the wings up on the right, Stan Harris mounted that one. That's a modeled petrel. It's the second specimen of modeled petrel for Humboldt County, and I think the fourth record. There's but what's really amazing about this is the story of it coming here. Um, three of our students were out on South Spit of Humboldt Bay. I wrote the dates down and I left the notes in the other room. I think it was 2003. Yeah, five, was, something mm -hmm. like that. I think it was 2005. Maybe. And uh, they were out on South Spit um, surveying hunters. It was it was duck hunting season or goose hunting season. And they were out there talking to hunters. And they saw this bird fly in, crash land in a bush. A hunter went over and picked it up. They took it from the hunter and it died right there in their hands. This the the fourth record, I think, of modeled petrol mm -hmm. for Humboldt County and the second specimen. Um, then we have up here a wedge-rumped storm petrel. Mm, yes. And this is also called a Peruvian storm petrel because it's the Peruvian subspecies. And this was found, what year was it, 2016? I think Just so. Just a few years yeah. ago. Devin Camerick's Yes. found Devin, it. Devin, one of our On the South students, Spit, too. Also on South yeah. Spit. He brought it to me. He said, look, I found a leech's storm petrel. Well, that's a leech's storm petrel to the left of it. And look at the difference in size. And not I'm not, I may not be the best bird identifier in the world, but I get to handle them. So I immediately went, this, this, is, this is too small. What the hell is mm -hmm. this? So what's special about our wedge room storm petrel, that is not just a first for Humboldt County. That is a range expansion for the species. The yeah, species I think had, had never seen been seen, I think, north of Monterey County. That's right. So, um, yeah, or maybe even San Luis Obispo County. I know they've had them, say, no, Marin County. Marin. They've had them in Marin, Sonoma, off of uh, um, 
Bodega Bay off of the, the mount there. Oh, what's the name of that mount? That sea mount. I can't think um, of it right now. Uh, anyway, so another cool story. Students just randomly finding things that turned out to be turn out to be pretty special. Very cool. Right over here. Uh oh. Oh, this is the oldest bird. Cordell Bank. Yeah, thanks, Leah. Cordell Bank. That's it. That's <laughs> what I mean. Cordell Bank. Thank you. This is oh. the oldest bird in our collection. This is a passenger pigeon. They went extinct in 1914. Um, this specimen was collected in Oneida, New York in, in uh, 1874. And when I look at this bird, it looks bright and fresh. It's not faded or moth-eaten. Of course, it's probably full of arsenic, but it, it just looks so fresh and new to me. And the idea that this bird is, is almost 150 years since it died kind of boggles my mind. So passenger pigeons, once considered to be the most abundant spe species on planet Earth, um, down to zero in 1914. And our other extinct specimen is a Carolina parakeet. And it's not as well known as I think as the passenger pigeon, um, but also went extinct just a few years after that in 1918. And, and this was a parakeet that lived in North America, <laughs> which is crazy. I, I've read accounts of this bird decorating bare trees in Kansas in the winter. Can you imagine what that would look like? Um, and uh, mm. one of the tragedies to me about this bird's extinction is that people kept it as pets and it just sort of went out of style as being kept as a pet. And if people had continued to breed them in captivity, we would still have Carolina parakeets today. Right. So, mm. but we don't, mm. but they're beautiful. Um, oh, let me show another. Oh, we got a bingo step in yeah, here, right? How are, how are we doing on time? Uh, let's see. 255. We got five minutes. I mean, we could go a little over, too, if, if people don't mind and you don't mind. I mean, oh, okay. Whatever. Keep talking as long as people yeah. keep listening. Yeah, we'll just get some okay. more coffee. <laughs> so, this, this is a bean goose. Bean, bean geese. Uh, this is a, a Eurasian species of goose. Um, this bird was shot by a hunter in the Arcata Bottoms in 2015, I think. Uh, let's see, yeah, 11, 8, 2015. And he shot it and he, he thought it was a white-fronted goose. They are very similar, there's a white-fronted goose. Um, and then he picked it up and he realized it was something else. So instead of eating it, he put it in his freezer for a year. <laughs> and then and then he pulled it out and showed it to a birder friend of his. And his birder friend went, oh, well, that's a bean goose. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it was um, Terry Schultz, actually. Was it Terry? Yeah, he said, he, I think he called me and said, hey, I got this guy working in my yard, doing yard work for him. And he said he had a bean goose in his, in his fridge or something like that. And he showed Terry the picture, and uh, and then Terry shared the picture with me and a couple other people or something. We're like, oh my god, that's a bean goose, and uh, yeah, it's been submitted to the CBRC as a tundra bean goose. Well, I um, took a whole. So they have split the, the the American Ornithological Union, in their wisdom, has split this species into two different species: tundra and taiga. Taiga, yeah. And I took a lot of measurements on this goose. And it seemed intermediate to me, and I I was not able to confidently assign it to That's... either of these. And in reading the sources um, based on which they split the species, I don't understand why they split. The it's species. really uh, people hate it. I don't birders think it's a good hate split. the split because there's been at least two bean geese now in California. That like there was one in Sacramento this past winter that. I think was unfortunately shot somewhere else by a hunter after it was seen at Consumers River Preserve. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was difficult. I don't think anybody put a full name to that. And well, the this first one, one I had in the hand and I can't put it in Yeah, into it. I know. They're so difficult. And then somebody also took DNA and tried to <laughs> DNA analysis, yeah. but they weren't able to, to uh, figure it out. Yeah, so, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. Anyway, as I was going to say, as far as I know, this is the only um, North American specimen 
um, outside of Alaska, but there are some others in Vertnet, but I, I, some of, most of them are captive and some of them don't say, but I suspect they're captive. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to know, but I, I suspect it's the only, one of the wow. only specimens, although this hunter shot one, maybe wow. somebody got that. Yeah, anyway, so that was, you know, you just never know what's gonna Man. show up. Yeah. Um, I, could, I could tell a story about half the birds in here. That would yeah. take a long time. <laughs> um, so do we wanna do maybe a questions? And yeah, let's see. And do then we, if there's anything people wanna request. Let's check and like see. see. Catherine um, uh, uh, McNally asks, um, some of the birds were out for research and what kind of research do people use these for? Oh, thank you. Great, great, great question. question. Um, there we go. Back to Margaret. Um, so uh, there, there are lots of different kinds of research that you can do on specimens. Historically, spe you needed a specimen if you're going to just describe a new species, if you were going to measure things. Um, even today, if you're going to describe the species, you really should have a specimen because otherwise, so one of the basic concepts of science is that it's repeatable. So when you read a scientific paper, it has a very detailed method section. And the reason for that is that another researcher can come and redo your research and confirm that it's correct. So if you describe a species because you took a picture of it, nobody can really revisit that if they don't have the specimen. They can't take measurements. They can't take DNA. They can, so, so having a specimen is really important. Um, and as I just alluded, every one of these specimens is a package of DNA. So you can do DNA analysis on them. Every one of these specimens is a package of all kinds of molecules and people can do research taking a, a sample of feather and, um, and do molecular analysis on it. So some examples of some, some um, studies that have been done using museum specimens. Um, you can take a feather and do a molecular isotope analysis that will tell you where on the food chain the bird was feeding when it grew that feather, maybe a hundred years ago. So there's a researcher who was, so marble merlets are endangered and we always think they're endangered because of habitat loss, because they nest in old growth trees. But this researcher felt that maybe they have other reasons that they're endangered and compared historic specimens, molecular isotopes from feathers, to living bird feathers and was able to show that marble merlets today are eating lower on the food chain than they were early in the 20th century. And what happened is in the mid forties, the sardine fishery collapsed and marble merlets no longer had these very uh, nutritious fish to eat. And they're eating lower on the food chain. They're eating, eating krill or shrimp. Maybe that's impacting them. And that's part of the reason why they're not doing well. Maybe it's not just habitat. So it's a window into the past. They were able to go back and do this crazy molecular analysis. Now, 100 years ago, when somebody collected marble merlets in 1920, they couldn't have imagined what, how somebody would be able to use that specimen. Um, and that's why somebody might find a dead robin and say, do you want a dead robin? You probably already have 30 dead robins. Yes, I want a dead robin because I don't know how they'll be able to use it in the future. And we're documenting the environment. We're documenting the time, like the DDT and the eggs. You're documenting the environment um, for that time. And we want to keep doing that. Um, so people have done genetic analyses on endangered species where making decisions about how to reintroduce species to a location based on the genetics that was there historically. Um, there's a study where someone was just measuring the shape of wings on songbirds, Eastern songbirds, and showed that because of forest fragmentation, the shape of the wings has changed. So birds are evolving to this altered habitat that humans have created. Um, I can go on and on and on. <laughs> There are lots of ways to, these are windows into the past. Yeah. And it's critical that we keep, that we, we maintain these, co these collections and that we add to them currently mm -hmm. to document today because we're living in a changing world. And if we want to understand it, people in the future need to have a problem. So what would happen to DDT? Um, so there are lots of ways. Last semester, 
I walked into a museum without students because there are no students here. And I decided to do some outreach to the students. And I made a series of videos um, outreaching the museum to the students. And so you guys are welcome to look at those videos. Um, I don't know how to get that link to you. I can tell you how to get there. <laughs> um, maybe if somebody who's listening can find them, if you go to oh, the- looks like, uh, looks like Bob maybe posted the link in it's, the chat. It's called the Socially Distanced Wildlife Museum. Okay. If you found that- I think good. Bob did, yeah. Right. Thank you, he's very fast. Uh, let's see, so we got a couple other questions so here. I just want to quickly say, so in those videos, I have, oh, one, yes. I have one video that has examples of how how the specimens are used. So it's all about how specimens are used in research. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so let's see. We got a couple other questions from people. Um, is it illegal to keep wild bird feathers that you find on the ground? Yes, it is. Yes. yes it is. There you go. So the, the, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is a really great law because it protects all native birds from, um, from being killed. But because it's very hard to prove that you killed a bird, you're, it also makes illegal possession of a dead bird or any of its parts. Mm -hmm. So it is illegal to pick up a gull feather on the beach, which seems ridiculous unless you go back, back to why that law is in place. You right. can't prove that you didn't kill the bird. So yeah, it is illegal. Okay. I have a permit. <laughs> okay. So if you guys need a feather, get to Marta, pick up the feather for, no, I'm just kidding. We don't do that. I'll pick up the um, feather and put it here. My yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, do you have bird nests in the collection? Oh, yes. Um, so the egg collectors did sometimes collect bird nests. We have um, eggs from about 3,500 nests, and we have maybe 300 nests themselves. So sometimes they collected the nest, but not that often. Okay. Um, some of the nests are really interesting to look at. I've had um, a lichenologist come to look at hummingbird nests, nests because hummingbirds will, um, and this hummingbird especially, will decorate right. um, the nest with lichen. So it's interesting that you get this crossover of botanist interested in nests yeah. and lichenologists. And, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, never, never even thought of that. Um, let's see, we got some other questions. Oh. By the way, I didn't bring that northern perula nest with oh, me today, Rob but I, I got the northern perula nest for, for you from 2004. Um, okay, here's another question we just got here. How do you come across things for your collection? If there's anything found that can be added, how is it properly submitted in ways that are not legal? That's a good question. In ways, ways that are legal. Um, it is a good question. I'm not sure I should answer it for fear I might incriminate myself. Um, <laughs> so it is illegal for pe people to pick up dead birds and bring them to me. That is technically illegal. You can call me and I can go pick it up. Now I do take things that people bring to me and I record them on my permit because really there is the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Mm -hmm. If I suspect that somebody killed something illegally to bring it to me, I would totally turn them in. But, you know, if somebody calls me and says, I've got this dead bird here that got hit by a car on 14th Street. Um, can I bring it to you? You know, I could have them stay there and I'll run out and get it or they could bring it to me. And it's technically legal while they have possession. But I think there's a good faith concept. Apparently, there used to be a letter from, I never saw it, but I heard about it, from the Fish and Wildlife Service that's that sort of, said, yeah, we know this happens and we're really okay with it. Cause that's the point of the law is not to keep those specimens from or those dead birds from becoming specimens because ultimately dead birds saving live birds. If we're trying to protect birds, adding to these research collections with things that are dead anyway is really to the benefit of the resource we're trying to protect. Totally. And they understand that. So technically illegal, but practically we do this. Uh -huh. Let's see. And the feds know if they're okay with it. <laughs> right. Uh, let's see. Let me check the chat here and just see if there's anything. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, and uh, thank you, Shoshana, for posting the links there. Bob just mentioned that. So 
Shout out to Shoshana for all your great help there. Uh, let's see. Does anybody have any other questions or have any uh, requests for to see anything else before we call it a day here in the Wildlife Museum? Um, you know, I might have one. If nobody else does, I might have <laughs> one request. Yeah. Since I don't know if people have seen it, but um, the great gray owl that was hit um, from up in Redwood National Park back in the 80s. I know a lot of people saw the recent great gray owl that showed up in Prairie Creek Redwoods and also then later showed up off Alder Grove Road the next year. Um, oh yeah, and please, yeah, if you're watching from out of town or anything like that, please uh, just shoot a note in the chat of where you are coming from and uh, be great to hear from where everybody's from. And even if you're from Eureka, or even if you're from McKinleyville, uh, even if you're from the Wildlife Museum, Tamara could just go jump on and uh, and uh, just say where she's from if she wants. Who knows? Anyways, we're just gonna go look at this great gray owl real quick. And uh, we could tell the little story about that one since it's uh, kind of a sad story, but an important story. This is the first county record of great gray owl for Humboldt County, the largest owl in North America. It's a really, really, really beautiful bird. Um, this bird was seen up at Prairie Creek State Park. I, can't, I think it was 1983. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? I think so. Yeah, somewhere um, around then. And birders were flocking, as birders do, um, to see this bird, the first county record. And it kept flying across the highway back and forth. And sure enough, one day it got hit by a truck. And that's when it was still the highway, right? Before the 101 went over the pass. Oh, I, I think it was, that. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I don't know when the pass went. Yeah. Bypass. Yeah, so, um, yeah. So really sad story for this beautiful bird, but it, you know, at least we get to see it and yeah. appreciate it now. And, yeah, it's a good And it use. has actually been used in research. It's had some measurements taken and photos of the molt for some uh, researchers who are looking at Greek real molt. Now the second record of Great Grey Owl for Humboldt County, um, I don't remember what year it was, maybe 10 years ago. I don't remember what year it was, something like around 10 mm. years ago. The second record of Great Grey Owl for Humboldt County, it was found on uh, Myrtle Avenue. Near Indiana oh, Island. that's right. And this bird was found on the side of a road by a kid, incapacitated. That's right. And it went to rehab and it died within two hours of being picked up. Wow. Does the specimen come here? Or? Yeah, so that one okay. prepared as a study story. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I forgot all about yeah. that bird. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and here's all, here's, this is all just a case of, looks like mostly local owls. Pretty much every one of them, except the Phrygian's pygmy owl, yeah. has shown up. There's Eastern. Oh, Eastern Screech Owl, too, has shown up in Humboldt County. Yeah. So anyways, so if we don't have, if nobody has any other, oh, we do have a couple further questions here. Okay, so we'll just, uh, let's see. Okay, once you've, here, let me get this question here. Once you've reopened, what would the hours be to see the collection? Oh, the hours are the hours of the building, which I believe is seven to ten or nine. It's been so long, I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on, on Monday. The reality we live in now. <laughs> Monday through Thursday, I think it's seven to nine, and then Friday is seven to five, and closed on the weekends, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah, once campus is open. Come on by. Okay. Cool. Um, let's see. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Donna, for commenting that. Um, Tamar is always very enthused about the Wildlife Museum, and, and it's always a pleasure to talk to her about this here. Um, and we haven't done one of these. We, I mean, we haven't done like a museum tour for Godwood Days for many years, right? Yeah, we used to do them. It's been a long time. Yeah, yeah. We well, we might have to do this uh, next year. Again. Yeah, so I want to tell you guys um, as we're wrapping up that I'm also things people don't know about that I'm super excited about is 
um, our newest display, which we are hoping to have a display case built for it over the summer, it gets its own display case. And it will be a very, 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 very large display case um, because we have a California condor. And if you do go to those videos, I do have a video on uh, the condor. Wow. The condor putting it together. So. Wow. So I'm super excited to be able to display a condor. Awesome, awesome. Well, cool. So we got uh, three thirteen here, and I think I might have to be closing it up here because I gotta get ready for the next uh, event we have here at uh, five o'clock. And um, let's see. Somebody asked if we could see the nest. Do we have any nests that are close? By maybe that we could look at real quick, or you have to go back into the museum. Okay, but you have to go back anyway. Let's yeah, see. I gotta go back anyway. So here we're gonna, we're just gonna walk back because there's, there's the bird. Just oh, there's the Argus back. pheasant. Boom. Just boom. Okay. Feathers. Zoom. Here we go. <laughs> okay, we're walking back because I got my backpack over there anyway. So we gotta walk back. So we'll show you a quick nest here. Well, thanks everyone for, for coming. Interest. And if you've been working in the museum pretty much every day, or you're not here every day, right? Right now? Most days. Most days, yeah. Okay. Trying to get those. Oh, go ahead. Our alarm is going off. Uh-oh. What did we do? Uh-oh. Oh no, the Argus feathers are gone. Okay, we're over here. Okay, so we'll just take a quick look oh, at a nest here. Nest. Yeah. And then uh, we'll just call it quits here. No, I have to get a key. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's see, we got any other questions here? Uh, do you have to schedule a tour of the collection? when you reopen that is. Yeah, you can just come in and wander through the building to see all the displays. Okay. And if I'm here, my door is open and you're welcome to come in. Cool, all right. If you want to see something special or wanted to talk to me, it'd be good to make a point. Okay, so Galaxy Tab A, we are gonna open the nest collection here maybe we'll see i think we're you know we're getting there here's a pelican to look at while you're nice perspective on the pelican that is an old oh, specimen yeah. very cool aha uh -huh. uh -huh. here we go so um oh wow very cool. So these are stowers jays. Okay. Wow, those are very large nests. Look at how big that nest is. Just put my hand there so you can see how big that stellar's jay nest is. So these are vireo nests. Vireo ah, yes. Just really lovely, lovely nests in the fork. Yeah. Little, hanging, little tiny hanging nest in the fork of the tree. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. And also, uh, for people that want to see other nests, when the Marsh, the Arcata Marsh Interpretive Center opens back up, they have a couple of nests on display uh, that you could see with, by just walking in. Who knows when that will open back up, but uh, you can definitely see a few there too. And what's this one? These, these, these? yeah, these ones here. So oh, safe Phoebe. Cool. Okay. Western flycatcher. Oh, nice. Yeah, very cool. Some redwood bark mixed in. Yeah, very mm -hmm. cool. Okay, well, good. I think we're good. It's 317, everybody. So uh, the hanging nest was a vireo nest, and I think is a uh, warbling vireo. Oh, that was the red eyed vireo. Red eyed, oh, vireo olivaceous. Yes, right. Okay. Okay, so thank you, Tamar. Well, thank you for coming. Appreciate everybody. it. Appreciate your time today. Thanks for all the 
good work you do and keeping it all organized here and having such a passion for this here. And how long have you been here again? Oh, when did you start uh, working here? 21 years. 21 years. Yeah, oh. that's all. Not very long. Not very long at all. So, all right, everybody. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for hanging out here with us during Godwit Days mm -hmm. and checking out the museum. And uh, if you haven't donated yet, please consider doing so. It'll help us next year uh, put on a spring festival, hopefully all in person. But maybe we'll do some live things like this too, because they're pretty fun. Anyways, so um, anyways, I think I'll leave it at that. And we will see you all maybe, hopefully at five o'clock, maybe with a beer or a wine in your hand, or you know, if you want to just drink some water, tea, that's fine too. And uh, we'll see y'all then. So thanks a lot. Bye for now.